on from wherever you're joining. Thank you so much for being here today for this NCAR Explorer Series special event, leaving it all behind evacuation lessons from wildfires in Colorado with Kat Eshley, Will Cannon, Timothy Giuliano, and Scott Pierce. I am Dr. Abby McCumber, and I am an educator here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR. NCAR is a world-leading organization that is dedicated to understanding Earth system science, including our atmosphere, weather, climate, the sun, and the importance of all of these systems to our society. I am very excited and so glad that you all are here today just to learn more about how scientists from different disciplines can all come together to determine when and how to issue evacuation orders. For this event, some logistics, you will be able to ask our panelists questions following this panel. And Olia and Alexandra will help moderate that so we can ensure that we hear from both our in-person and virtual audience. If you are in person, you can raise your hand and we will give you a microphone and then you can ask your question. If you're joining us virtually, hello. Um, you can ask your questions using the Slido platform. If you scroll down the webpage, you will see the Slido window just below where you are seeing the live stream video of the event. If you haven't already, go ahead and click on the green join event button and then you can ask questions on the Q&A tab and answer questions on the poll tab. Kat, Will, Tim and Scott also have a few poll questions for us. So for both our in-person and virtual audience, you can definitely respond in Slido. For those in person, you can go ahead and feel free to use your phone. And if you have your laptop, you can also do that. So you can respond um, on Slido. Um, go to slido.com and enter the code hashtag NCARMSR. But please, please, please be sure to join Slido to add your thoughts to our word cloud question. What do you think of when you hear the word evacuation? Because we are definitely going to get to that really soon. What do you think of when you hear the word evacuation? Um, this event is also being recorded and will be available on the NCAR Explorer Series website. We have a series of very accomplished scientists, so the bios are going to be long. Just want to make sure that you know that. With us today, we have visiting scientists, Catherine Etchley and William Cannon, in addition to NCAR scientists, Timothy Giuliano and Scott Pierce. Dr. Catherine Edgley is an assistant professor of natural resource sociology in the School of Forestry at Northern Arizona University and an early career faculty innovator with NCAR in the program's second cohort. As a wildfire social scientist, she explores how communities are adapting to and recovering from wildfire. Her research to date has spanned nine US states and several notable wildfires, including the devastating 2019 campfire in California. She earned her PhD in natural resources from the University of Idaho and holds a master's in, sci a master's in risk and environmental hazards and a bachelor's in geography from Durham University in the UK. William Cannon is currently a PhD student in the School of Forestry at Northern Arizona University, working with Dr. Catherine Edgley as part of the Early Career Faculty Innovator Program. His current work in wildfire social science explores how socially diverse communities interpret and respond to fire in evacuation and recovery context. Using a qualitative interview approach, he interviews, he investigates the, the diverse perspectives, knowledge, and experiences of communities affected by wildfires aiming to identify effective strategies and approaches that can facilitate a more inclusive and informed decision-making process. He earned a master's in geography at Northern Arizona University and a bachelor's in geography from the University of Utah. Timothy Giuliano is a project scientist at the Research Applications Laboratory of NCAR. Um, he joined NCAR in 2019 as a postdoctoral fellow after earning his bachelor's in meteorology from Millersville University and his master's and PhD degrees in atmospheric science from the University of Wyoming. His research focuses on numerical weather prediction with interests spanning a variety of lower atmospheric problems, including boundary layer dynamics and turbulence, while wildland fire prediction, meteorological impacts on renewable energy and aerosol cloud interactions. Scott Pierce is a software engineer at 
and Carr, where he helped develop the Vapor 3D visualization package for the geophysical sciences. Before joining NCAR, Scott designed and deployed remote sensing systems for atmospheric physicists and produced quantitative precipitation estimation analyses for various government agencies. He holds a bachelor's in electrical engineering and a master's in computing science from the University of Colorado Boulder. Scott and Tim's work in visualization of the East Troublesome Wildfire just won best overall visualization at this year's practice and experience in advanced research computing conferences. So congratulations on that. Okay. So I am almost on talking, I swear. I'm gonna pass it on to them. You can hear more interesting things in a second. Um, but before I turn it over to our speakers, let's check out your thoughts on our word cloud. So could Paul and Jesse please share Slido with us and the word cloud answers. Whoa. So I'm going to pass the mic to Kat so they can start discussing your answers. Uh, this is very uh, representative, I think, the community we're in right now. This recent history of fire in the area, you've had a lot of evacuations recently in this area. I'm seeing a lot of great themes here, emergency, safety, and then there's a lot of leaving really fast, which I think is very unique to the experience that this area has had. Usually we might see some uh, kind of planning stuff and then some very visual language. So we can see a little bit of that. Um, a lot of concern and um, conversation that's really shining through in this. Can we go back to, if I press this, will we go back to the PowerPoint? Hey, thank you. Okay, so you heard a little bit in our introductions about uh, our very diverse backgrounds. We, we're social scientists, we're modelers, we're visualization folks, um, and we all came together because of a program here at NCAR called the Innovators Program. It brings social science professors from universities across the US to NCAR so that they can work with modelers um, in the different labs here. And we have this idea of convergence research. So what can we achieve together that we couldn't have achieved if we kept in our disciplinary silos? So when I wrote the proposal for this project, my background is wildfire social science. I'm really interested in how communities are responding to and adapting to fire, how different experiences might influence different, different responses. Um, so we all came together around this interest in fire and how we can make people safer in the long run. Um, so we have some other collaborators who couldn't join us tonight, Franco Klesovic, um, Rajesh Kumar, Gabby Fister, uh, and there's many more who have dipped in and out. So the work we'll share tonight is um, a combination of everyone's uh, efforts in that. So this question was how many wildfires are there on average in, in the state of Colorado? Most folks are leaning towards at 3,600. Um, the correct answer is actually the highest one. Oh, not quite the highest one, 5,600. So a lot of those are probably less than 100 acres. We often think that large fires really kick off around that 100 acre mark. So that number is probably a lot of lightning ignitions at a small acreage. Um, maybe 95% of wildfires stay under a few acres. So it's that 5% that we really want to be concerned about. Could we now head to the uh, why might some people not evacuate question? Great, so we've got a, um, a broad range of things here. Pets, leaving things behind that can um, create a lot of anxiety, understandably. Limited mobility, attachment to home, our connections to place are really important in the ways that we navigate and think about these fires. Uncertainty, no call came. That is a big conversation right now. I'm sure it's the same in this community with recent fires, um, whether we should expect something formal or not, or if there's time for that. Um, great, so I think then we'll head back to the PowerPoints, if that's okay. So I want to start with a little overview of what we know about evacuation. 
Um, in those uh, slides, we really talked about, um, in those questions you just answered, you can kind of see this story of increasing fire risk. If we're having more than 5,000 fire starts just in this state, we're talking about tens of thousands across the US. And then if you scale that up, think about what's happening in Canada. We see a lot in Australia, increasingly in Europe and South, uh, South Amer America. This is a big conversation right now about how do we keep communities safe and how do we help them make decisions that keep them safer? Um, a lot of that story also goes with more frequent fires and larger fires happening in locations that didn't happen before. So uh, I'm based in Arizona. We're seeing a lot of fires in the Sonoran Desert right now that there hasn't really been a track record of before. And it's telling us a lot of new information about how different kinds of vegetation burn, uh, what a fire might look like in a community that's predominantly cacti and grasses, very different environments to what we think of when we think about fire. Um, and if you think back, maybe even just, um, far, well, let's say 10, 20 years ago, a 50,000 acre fire was considered really big. Now we're in the six digits. We're seeing multiple two to 300,000 acre fires a year. That's um, a really concerning pattern that we've seen almost an order, order of magnitude in the size of fires. Uh, we had our first giga fire, which I think is a million acres um, a couple years ago. Um, so we're on this roller coaster for a, a long time to come, I think. When these communities are increasingly at risk because of these fire activities and people are developing out into these areas, uh, there are a lot of different factors at play in how we become at risk and how we change our risk for fire. Um, most of the time, you'll hear officials say evacuation is the number one safest thing to do during a fire. Um, and that's for a number of reasons, but predominantly, if we can take people out of the equation, priority is always life, life of the public and of firefighters. It's a lot safer in a fire risk area when we don't have to worry about people coming in and out and uh, making decisions we might not expect them to. But as we saw on that uh, slide a little while ago, you can have some very different reasons for why you might not evacuate and stories behind that. We touched on some great ones in that slide. I want to add a few extra ones. And I'd say the reasons behind this are pretty infinite. There's a lot of reasons um, that are valid or um, out of circumstance. The first is you find out about a fire too late to evacuate safely. You really want to think about where the safest place is and if driving through a lot of fire um, is your only option. It may be safer if you've done a lot of work around your property to stay there. Um, some people have a lot of experience fighting fire. The most common folks I see staying off the fire in my work are often people who've had a career in firefighting. They've been a volunteer firefighter. They think they have a sense of um, what to do, and then they are uh, good enough at reading fire behavior that hopefully they're humble enough to know when to step out of that situation or leave. Then we've got lower risk perceptions. Sometimes you might hear about a fire and it's a, a way away and you make that uh, decision for yourself of what risk you're willing to take. And that's a big part of the conversation we'll talk about today. Um, another one is lack of trust in professionals, especially in rural areas. There can be a lot of distrust for the forest service, for the government. Um, Maybe you want to stay on your property because you don't trust them to protect it. And that may or may not be true, especially in fast moving fires. We can't, uh, we can't always be everywhere all at once. Um, but that can be a big driver of why people might stay behind without a skill set uh, around fire suppression. So all of these together, you can see, tell a little bit of a story about experience um, with wildfire. Do you have it or not? Does it drive your risk perception? Um, have you been in a fire before and now you have a clearer idea of what you do in the next fire? Or you want to change your approach completely because uh, the outcome of your recent fire um, wasn't quite where you wanted to be. And it turns out there's a huge amount of research out there about uh, people and the decisions they make during evacuation. And a lot of studies that happen before fire, so we're asking members of the public about hypothetically what they would do during fire. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, fire event happened. Yep, I'd make a decision and I'd act, it, act on it immediately. I'd evacuate as soon as I heard of something in my area, or um, I'm ready to stay and fight fire on my property, or maybe you've done a lot of work on your property and you want to shelter in that. In reality, we know that there's this kind of uh, wait and see period instead. Fire happens, and then you're in this information gathering cycle. 
um, what do we know about the fire? How far away is it? Is it moving fast? What are my other neighbors doing? You're uh, collecting information to decide what you're going to do in that specific scenario. And fires behave very differently. So um, it can really vary depending on that information that's coming in. And while you're doing that, we find that a lot of people look for two sources. So they might hear it from somewhere else and they want to triangulate it with another person or another source. So you might see it on TV. You call your neighbor, what do you think about this? What are you doing? Um, or you see all your neighbors packing their stuff and you go, huh, maybe I should think about this. And you call your cousin who's in Washington State and is a firefighter and they're gonna say, um, I think you should leave also. Um, but we very rarely act on one source of information unless the time period is really condensed where it's very, very obvious that um, the threat is imminent. I think now I want to turn to, uh, there's a slide uh, from the Slido. How many of Colorado's largest fires um, happened in the past 20 years? Or how many of the 20 largest fires happened in the last 20 years? Yep. Oh, absolutely. Is this closer? Better? <laughs> so how many of the top 20 biggest fires in Colorado's history have taken place in the last 20 years? And we've got a good group of people who've got it. All 20 have happened in the last 20 years. So this uh, situation is really condensed in time, at least in recorded history, to the last uh, 20 years. Can we go back to the slides? Sorry. So the picture I'm trying to paint here is how complicated fire decision making can be. We have all these different sources, all these different ideas about what might necessitate action and what won't. And that's why I think our team here um, kind of brings together things in a different way. So this project that we're talking about today um, falls under this category of convergence research, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's about bringing together different disciplines, integrating our methods so that we can find out new information that maybe we wouldn't have known before. In our project, we really wanted to leverage all the wonderful atmospheric and fire modeling that's happening at NCAR. Um, so in our team, we looked at some fires that have happened in Colorado recently, and we drew upon all the modeling information from them to make visualizations. So you can see that on the left-hand side there. Scott will talk more about that in a minute. That's his wonderful work. Um, and we turned them into videos. And then we took them out to community members. And we used them to talk about their experiences. Um, so we met with folks in this area and also over in the Grand Lake area. And we asked them, tell us about your evacuation experience from start to finish. And then when they were done, we'd bring this out and say, does this help you remember anything else? Does this tell you something else? Um, and our goal was we wanted to learn from them about how they make decisions, but we also wanted to give them information about the event they experienced so they can process it, they can think about it, um, so that they have a clearer picture of the story that they can take forward as well. Um, we, to date, have done almost 100 interviews with different folks. Um, and uh, we are still a work in progress on the Marshall Fire. So if you experience that and you'd like to talk with us, my email is at the end of this. We'd love to hear from you. Um, then I think uh, we'll go back to the next slide on Slido, which is the uh, how fast are the East Troublesome uh, wind speed. How fast are the So for the fastest wind speed, for the fastest wind speed, uh, we actually had the fastest wind speed being the East Troublesome at 60 miles per hour. Um, so it's kind of surprising it looks like for this crowd. <laughs> oh. Oh. That's, that's the one I had, but it said 60. Oh, might have a discrepancy to discuss in the Q&A. Yes, we can discuss in the Q&A. Can we go back to the slides, please? Great. 
Great, so for a little background on the two fires we studied, the first one, the East Troublesome, uh, happened in a much more rural area than here, um, so people were a lot more spread out. You can see from this evacuation map, covered quite a large area. Um, uh, you can see some areas were left on pre-evac. Uh, there was also a lot of second home ownership, which created a lot of unique uh, evacuation conditions, um, as we'll get to in a bit. Uh, so overall, the fire uh, on October 21st, 2020, uh, made a large run of approximately 90 acres in one day. Uh, so covered significant ground, uh, made a lot of uh, challenging uh, conditions for evac. Uh, most residents experienced about 15 minutes from getting any pre-evac notice to getting a mandatory evac notice because of that significant run. And that was during the evening near dinner time for these people, um, which created other challenges. Uh, overall, 192,000 acres with 366 homes lost. Onto a fire I'm sure most people in this crowd are familiar with, the Marshall Fire. Um, smaller footprint, 6,026 acres, but very um, destructive. Uh, over 1,000 homes lost, over $2 billion in damage. Uh, and most people um, that got evacuation notices in this area had a, less than 20 minutes uh, between that um, notice and needing to leave immediately. So some comparisons between the two fires, both were very fast moving at the time of evacuation. Um, little difference uh, is the East Troublesome uh, kind of sat for a while for a week and was burning off in a forested area. So people were aware of it and maybe kind of made up their mind that it was gonna stay over there. Um, that might not necessarily be the case, but. Um, and then both occurred outside of a traditional fire season. So um, October and then December 30th, obviously for the Marshall Fire. Um, kind of might change how resources are allocated or what resources are available for suppression. Um, changes how evacuation planning is. And then there's also the, just challenges of the weather that came with that. And getting to that, the wind-driven aspect of these fires, speed was a big factor in the rate of spread for both fires. A um, Little bit of a difference, the Marshall Fire, obviously a grass fire, so it spread really fast, versus a forest fire where you have these larger fuels that can burn for longer time sitting in the area. Um, there was also the urban versus rural comparison, so for evacuation you have this issue of um, condense people in a, in a single area, or you have people really spread out that you all need to get out through a single egress point. So different challenges for both, but both had um, very distinct challenges. And then fire behavior also um, changed once it hit structures for the East Troublesome. This resulted in combination with the wind in the plume collapsing, um, which kind of acted as a um, kind of cascading force for embers to spot fire further from the flame front. Um, and then for the Marshall Fire, um, once it hits structures, you have these wooden fences that are spreading the fire. You have different structures burning at different rates. Um, and then there's also very localized um, changes due to those structures and their placement. And then I'll hand it over to Tim. All right. Um, so before we get to the beautiful animations that that Scott's created. I uh, wanted to first discuss the numerical modeling that we do here at NCAR and that we've done for this project that really um, kind of you know makes the visualizations possible. So, uh, just for some kind of general background, you know, wildfires, of course, are very complex, and there's this intimate relationship between wildfires and the atmosphere. So. You know, many folks have had a campfire. You know, fires are very hot. Now imagine scaling that up to a wildfire, right? There's a lot of energy, uh, heat, and moisture that's released when, when fuels are being combusted. And so we need to really uh, capture that behavior in the model accurately if we want to, you know, depict how the fire is behaving, right? So uh, as it says here, the wind and the fuel moisture are, are some of the uh, most important contributors to uh, fire spread. Um, the wind, of course, will affect how fast the fire moves, but also in which direction it moves. Winds can be highly variable, and so, uh, yeah, capturing that well is, in, in, is important. Um, and yeah, this feedback uh, can also lead to uh, development of uh, what are called pyro uh, cumulus clouds. It's an example that's shown in the top right. So it's this link between uh, the emissions from the fire 
um, they release a bunch of aerosol, heat, and moisture, and that can actually create uh, pyrocumulus clouds, which, which can be really detrimental to, for example, firefighters on the ground. So really it's this uh, kind of tight interaction that we need to capture uh, in the numerical model. So in order to predict fire spread, we need to use um, what's called uh, numerical weather prediction. Now many folks are probably familiar with weather models, right? You tune in to the news or go to the National Weather Service and you're getting information about the weather from weather models that are run. And so what we need to do is we need to couple that type of model with a fire behavior model so that we can inform the fire model how the fire will spread based on you know, the atmospheric winds and, and different variables. So on the left hand side here is just an example of kind of a, uh, a numerical weather prediction model output that you may be familiar with. This example is just precipitation. Um, so we have this information covering a large area, um, but we really need to get down to the fine scales, right? Fires are occurring at, at relatively local and regional scales, and so we need to somehow go from this kind of broader picture down to really fine scale uh, fire behavior that depends on um, these uh, different meteorological parameters, and it really aims to predict the fire spread, the amount of heat that's released, the amount of smoke that's released, and all of this is uh, dependent on you know, wind speed, terrain slope, and the fuels on the ground uh, and in the canopy potentially. So this picture here is, is a low intensity kind of ground fire as we call it. You can see that it's just kind of the ground fuels that are being burned. Uh, whereas you can also have you know, events like this where the canopy uh, ends up being consumed and you can have kind of this really large fire. And in this case, of course, you have a lot more uh, energy being released to the atmosphere and more intense fire. So again, we go from this kind of um, kind of bigger picture weather model down to much finer scales in order to really capture the wildfire. Uh, so <clears throat> the idea here is we take uh, outputs from yeah, National Weather Service or National Center for Environmental Prediction and we kind of zoom in, hone in on an area that we're interested in for you know, where a particular fire may be occurring. In this case, you know, we just uh, are showing Colorado as an example because of course we're interested in a lot of the fires that are happening here. And so we refine down in our numerical model to this uh, smaller region. And then what happens is we can go down uh, kind of in, in increments and we can refine further and further and ultimately, we can get down to the scales uh, that a wildfire may, uh, may be covering. And so in our model, we need really fine uh, grid cells to be able to resolve the fine structure of the fire. But um, in any case, we can do this over different regions. You know, we, we really can adapt to, to where the fires may be. So just to show you an example of some of the model outputs uh, from a simulation that we ran uh, for the Cold Springs fire, which occurred in 2016 up near Nederland. Some of you may be familiar with that. What we're showing here is an animation um, from the model outputs and the, uh, the color uh, volume rendering there is the smoke that's generated from the fire. And there are wind arrows uh, down near the surface, which shows the wind uh, speed and direction. And you can see really how much variability there is in where the smoke's going, how much smoke is being produced, um, kind of at what levels it's being transported at. And so really in order to get this, um, this accurate picture, we need to be coupling the atmosphere with the fire. And also of course the fire is feeding back on the atmosphere, right? So it's this two way coupling that, that we need to uh, really be able to capture. And from the simulation on the right hand side there is just an example of uh, the observed perimeter in the black and the predicted perimeter in the red from our uh, numerical simulation. Overall, uh, it's doing pretty well. We consider that a, a pretty good simulation. Uh, the model does tend to overestimate the perimeter. This was because in the model we don't have suppression efforts um, and that was actually a big uh, um, reason why the fire didn't spread further in this particular case. So um, just some, some general thoughts about uh, the modeling side of things. Um, of course, the models and the simulations are just one piece of the very large puzzle, right? 
we really rely on measurements and observations from the ground, from satellite, and that help constrain uh, our models. Um, but also making our model outputs useful for the consumer, whoever that may be, whether it's the public, whether it's decision makers, um, whether it's for research, right? So we need to think carefully about how you know, this modeling piece fits into the, the larger picture. Um, again, this is just one uh, element of the decision support. Um, and then a quote here, all models are wrong, but some are useful, right? So um, really understanding um, you know, certain qualities about your model that may be good and it, it performs well in certain situations, but understanding its limitations and when it may not be performing well, um, that's really important. And also, just want to mention that, um, as Katz kind of alluded to, you know, this is really convergent research, and it involves and requires collaboration between many groups of people, um, from you know, fire ecologists, um, fire behavior analysts, incident meteorologists, um, emergency responders, and also the public. Right. <clears throat> so this is a uh, an ecosystem that requires input and feedback uh, from all parties. And uh, just another quote, uh, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, and practice there is, right? So um, oftentimes what we think is going to happen isn't what actually happens, and, and we need, again, that's why we need input from everyone, right? Because we, as scientists, tend to be uh, kind of siloed in our offices doing our research, but uh, really broadening out and getting input from other folks, especially those who are on the ground and can observe things um, anecdotally, that's, that's really critical, so. I think at this point, I'll pass it on to Scott. Hello. All right, I think this is uh, working. I'm actually gonna use the podium because I'll be using the cursor to uh, point some things out. <clears throat> I have some visualizations to show, but I also wanna talk about uh, why we produce these visualizations at NCAR and also get into the technical details of how it's done. So uh, NCAR is, a, uh, is the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and it's comprised of eight uh, labs or divisions. And the one that I'm a part of is called CISL. It's the Computational and Information Systems Laboratory. And CISL's main role at NCAR is to support the scientists with uh, the, the science that they're, they're conducting, mainly through uh, making sure that our supercompute clusters remain operational to run their massive simulations that are run continuously 24 hours a day. Um, at CISL, we also develop software to visualize the uh, simulations that are run on the supercompute clusters that we have, and that's what I do. I'm a part of a team of uh, four engineers and scientists, and we develop an application called Vapor. And let's. Yep. Test, test. Is that better? So Vapor is a uh, desktop application that can be run on the supercomputers, but you can also download it and install it on your home PCs. Um, we support uh, Mac OS, Windows, and Linux, so most operating systems out there are supported, and it's also open source, which means that you can look at the software, the code itself, modify it if you want, and it's just free to use. Uh, anyone can download it from our website, www.vapor.ucar.edu, and you can ask support questions if you like at vapor at ucar.edu. We also have sample data uh, that you can download. So um, Tim was kind enough to provide us with Marshall Wildfire sample data. It's pretty big. We only contain two time steps in the entire simulation, and it's almost a gigabyte. I believe the original simulation was more along the lines of two terabytes. So um, that's one of the reasons that we need Vapor to run on our supercompute clusters. It's just impractical to bring two terabytes of data onto a uh, laptop and it'll just take forever to render. Um, it's just so much data. We need the processing power of our supercompute clusters. So um, you might ask, why is NCAR developing a visualization application? And the fact of the matter is that 3D visualization is extremely difficult, and most scientists just don't have the time to uh, practice their science as well as do 3D visualizations simultaneously. So uh, with Vapor, our main mission statement is to make it as easy as possible to do visualization for uh, geophysical scientists, like the ones that work here at NCAR. Um, let's see, here's one of our first visualizations of the East Troublesome Wildfire that's looking, I believe, to the northeast. And um, it's using four renderers. Vapor is comprised of 11 renderers. 
uh, and each renderer takes the data and uh, depicts it according to color and opacity in different ways. Renderers that we use uh, for these fires are the volume renderer for smoke, the image renderer for the base map, a 2D data renderer for the fire perimeter, and then uh, the wind barbs are the arrows on the bottom that show the wind direction. The East Troublesome Wildfire was a pretty uh, notable use case. Well, let's see, did I miss one slide? Well, it looks like one of the slides didn't get updated, but I will uh, note that the East Troublesome simulation was a notable use case because during the time of the, uh, the fire, the forecast models were not as accurate as they really uh, could have been. And the reason for it is if you live out here in Colorado, you know about the uh, pine beetle infestation up in the woods that caused all these dead down trees that were not taken account for in the original model simulation. So uh, Tim's associate, Amy, uh, developed an AI algorithm that used the Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 satellite data from the European Space Agency to identify where this beetle kill existed. There's just not enough uh, resources by the National Forest uh, Service to survey all this wilderness um, on a continuous basis. I think the previous fuels were updated five years ago, so they were that far out of date, which led to um, the underprediction of the fire spread of the East Troublesome Fire. So, like I mentioned earlier, vapor is comprised of several different renderers. Each one uh, applies color, color and opacity to the data in different ways. One of the flagship renderers is the volume renderer which uh, uses a technique called ray casting. And how ray casting works is it basically, uh, what Vapor will do is it will load the data into the application, and for each pixel that exists on the screen, it will fire a ray or like a laser into the data domain, and that laser will sample the data uh, incrementally until it uh, saturates and says, uh, we've collected enough data, it's completely opaque, or it leaves the domain. If you've played video games like Minecraft, uh, ray uh, casting works in the same way, um, one laser per pixel, and then that thing just samples the, uh, the domain, whether it's uh, simulation data or uh, a video game. So what the uh, grid looks like, the, the actual data is like a cube of, of, grid, of gridded data with a data point, um, I guess, at each grid point. And so in Vapor, the ray will enter the domain from wherever pr your perspective is, and it will start sampling that gridded data until it reaches saturation or it exits the domain. And in this example, it's kind of simple. You can see that this ray coming down from the top maybe can sample the data at every 25 meters and then march down to the next 25 meters and continue accumulating whatever variable we're looking at. In this case, it would be smoke. And uh, eventually, the ray will exit, and then we will render a pixel to the, to the screen. Um, Tim's model is called WERF. It's the Weather and Research Forecast Model, and it's a little bit different. If I go back one slide, you can see this very nice regular grid, uh, equally spaced at all points, and there's even gridded points underneath this hill. The way that WERF works is that it uses what's called a terrain-following grid, where the grid will follow the shape and the contour of the Earth, and it will also uh, it'll curve around the Earth, but it will also be more uh, condensed at the surface. And the reason for that is because I think and correct me if I'm wrong on this, there's more convective mixing towards the surface, so you need a finer uh, resolution to resolve that. And it's also where we care about what's happening with the weather. So with these WERF models, you'll see, um, it, this is a very simplified example. Towards the surface, uh, the WERF model is very discrete, very small grid cells at the bottom, and then up in the stratosphere, you get very big grid cells. But the problem is, with our ray, we can't just sample at every 25 meters. And so one of the things that Vapor does to make it as easy as possible for scientists is accommodate for these special grids that scientists use. So we have an algorithm that samples this uh, grid correctly, which isn't always available with other visualization packages. Um, basically, how you use Vapor in the, in the volume renderer is through uh, this one mechanism. We call it the transfer function. It's kind of the bleeding or the beating heart of Vapor. Um, you can see over here, this histogram is uh, just a distribution function of one of the variables that we're looking at. Uh, the minimum value is about minus 20, and the maximum value is about 45. And, and we have this, this distribution of the variable. There's a lot of values. I would say this is my, maybe around zero, a few values by negative 20, and a few values at uh, 44. But basically, Vapor is applying this color palette to all the values that lie above it in the histogram. So did I skip ahead? So yeah. So basically, um, 
That's how the color is applied to a variable, but we also have to apply opacity. So right here on the right, you can see the, the flames and the smoke. You can kind of see this uh, transfer function over here. If we take all these dots and maximize them all the way to the top, everything is completely opaque. So all data values in our big brick are completely opaque. The ray caster is going in there and it's just bouncing off the surface of this cube. It's not penetrating into the actual data. So we have to use this, uh, a series of control points to reduce the opacity of certain values of the data to make it more transparent. And you can see here, by dragging them down a little bit, the uh, domain gets a little bit more uh, uh, transparent. And then if we drag them down even more, that's how we get to our final uh, see-through version of the volume renderer. And so, yeah, I think that's uh, it for the basics on how Vapor works. There's YouTube videos online to, uh, that go into more detail on all this. And again, it's free to download. Uh, sample data's there. So that's it. Thank you. Great. Yeah. So moving on to kind of results that we found talking with people affected by both fires uh, for the East Troublesome. We found that uh, there was a large influence of not having a recent fire evacuation, uh, at least of a fire of this size. There were previous fires, but none that really warranted a large evacuation like the East Troublesome. That posed challenges for residents planning as well as uh, managers in some aspects. Um, it was burning for about a week prior to evacuation. So again, some people weren't necessarily thinking that it was going to reach them. They thought they had it kind of under control at that point. Um, that led to texts kind of coming at short notice just because of how fast the fire was moving. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty about the fire location, and that was due a lot of uh, to wind speed and then the smoke. Um, especially when the plume collapsed, the smoke got denser, darker. It was harder to see the fire. Another aspect was the topography. There were a lot of mountain ridges that blocked view of the fire. And then on the professional side, the wind speeds um, were so high that it limited aerial reconnaissance. Um, so they were also uncertain in some aspects about the fire, at least from an overhead view. Um, an interesting aspect we found was that um, Highway 125 in that area was a mutual trigger point, both for professionals and residents. Um, this was due to um, the topography, um, how it channeled wind, the presence of fuels, expecting it as a fuel break, and then also its geographic proximity to the town. Uh, Professionals were trying to use it as a fuel break, but then when that plume collapsed, um, it just went right over and they weren't able to. Uh, since it was a rural community, a lot of people had um, family member or friends that were either working on the fire line or in emergency management in some aspect. So they were able to get information ahead of time, um, at least a little bit from those people. So they were saying, hey, it's crossed this highway. Residents knew um, just based on their local knowledge that that meant that they needed to start thinking more seriously about evacuation. Uh, the late seasonality of the fire for the East Troublesome posed some challenges and some benefits. Um, again, due to that second home ownership uh, and occurring outside of um, peak tourism season, there wasn't as many people as there necessarily would have been in the summer. Um, however, um, you also had people that were still up there visiting who maybe weren't keyed into the local um, evacuation notices. They didn't have that local knowledge of Highway 125. Um, so that posed some different challenges in that way. Similarly with the Marshall Fire, um, people weren't necessarily thinking about a fire occurring. Um, people weren't necessarily um, at home. Maybe they were out shopping, it was near New Year's, people were getting ready for New Year's. Um, it's sudden onset, um, posed household challenges. So kids being home from school, maybe they're at home, parents are out doing something, they need to go back and get them for evacuation. People that can't drive, um, being at home, we spoke to some people that needed to coordinate with neighbors to get people out. Um, there was limited receipt of official warning. Um, this was due in part to how fast the fire moved and also how the companies that manage evacuation notices operate. Um, it's on an opt-in service, so if people weren't opted in, they didn't get the notice. Um, there was uncertainty about the communication channels. People were expecting media or official notices, but again, it moved so fast media was behind maybe on the coverage, people weren't necessarily getting that information in that wait and see stage that they needed to make that decision to make the switch. Maybe until they actually saw flames in their backyard in some cases as we talked to people. And then traffic for both was a challenge. Um, East Troublesome Fire, they had one point of egress essentially for the major town. That created a lot of challenge. Marshall Fire in a densely populated area, a lot of challenges there getting people out. 
So when we took the visualizations to people, we did find some uses for them uh, for different groups, different uses. Um, for fire professionals and emergency managers, we found that it's really useful for rebuilding trust, justifying decisions, explaining challenges. Again, getting that broader scale view of the fire, why, why it behaved the way it did, how they responded, how they were able to respond. It's just giving additional context and it could be used as a tool in that way. For fire professionals specifically, we found that they could use it as a tabletop training exercise. Um, so pulling up the fire um, with maybe onboarding new folks um, or people that aren't used to fire in that area, showing the fire, asking them how they would respond, and then showing how they did respond or how they should respond, and then proceeding through the simulation in that way. Another use along that line would be onboarding incident command teams. When they switch over managing the fire, they need to onboard the other professionals on how to respond. Um, so you could use it in that way, pulling up the fire as it's behaved so far. Um, again, that's a time-sensitive, resource-intensive simulation, so that would be a future use down the line. Uh, on the mental health side, um, I did want to note in our interviews when we brought up the um, visualizations, we would, after exhausting our protocol, we would try to be very um, tactful in how we brought them up. We would um, ask if they were okay seeing the visualizations, explaining what was in them. If they didn't want to see them, we didn't bring it up. We didn't want to um, do that to people if they didn't want to. If they were, we would bring them up, and we found that for some people, it was really helpful for processing the event, um, discussing the traumatic experience. Um, it kind of was a visual, something else to look at, something else to kind of talk about their experience within a broader context. Um, so we think that this could be useful for mental health professionals used in a really um, intentional way to help process the event. Uh, for residents, kind of similar to the mental health, um, just helps them understand the fire behavior as a whole rather than just their experience contextualizing things. Close it. Oh, I skipped over one. Go back. Oh, here we go. Okay. So you're getting a sense now. Um, with uh, these visualizations, we were getting a little bit deeper into these uh, conversations than perhaps we would have done with um, just the conversation alone. When we brought out those visualizations, a lot of times people were really starting to go, ah, that's what was happening over there. Or my, uh, my friend on the other side of town told me um, this was happening. Now I see how that happened. So the story of the fire's dynamics really started to unfold in these conversations. And you're hearing a little bit from all of us about this uncertainty that shows up in models and in data, sometimes it's out of date, sometimes we know it's not as granular as um, maybe it might be in the future, but there's also a lot of uncertainty on the human behavior side. People are really unpredictable and um, can act in ways that maybe they didn't expect during a fire. There was a really good um, article uh, on the BBC a few years ago when the Port McMurray fire happened in uh, Alberta, where they went and interviewed people on what they took in a hurry when they left. And people were just grabbing like dinner trays. One person put their spaghetti in a Tupperware and that's all they took. <laughs> like you don't have much time to think, so you just go. So you don't always know what you're going to do in those events. But what we were able to find out is by talking about that uncertainty and seeing what the story is there, some of the factors that might influence where uncertainty takes control and we act more emotionally than maybe logically like um, models of how people behave might assume we do. So there are a few factors that we found um, maybe drove some more emotional responses across these two fires. The first was how long has it been since the fire began? Do, have we known about it for a little while and we're getting a bit comfortable with that risk being around? Uh, did it just come out of nowhere? We didn't know that fire could happen in that area, and it's really evolving rapidly without us having time to process it for ourselves. Um, then, do we know where that fire is when it's moving quickly? Um, you heard from Will, there was a lot of difficulty identifying um, where the fire was, I think, for both of these fires that we studied because of that fast movement, the conditions, the volatile behavior of the fire. Um, it makes collecting data really challenging and then communicating it really challenging. And if we're communicating, how much longer is it going to be before that information is out of date? Which leads us to what kind of information we have and how accurate do we think it is? Does it come from someone we trust? Does it come from Joe down the road who heard it on Facebook, so it must be true? Like where does that information come from and can we rely on it to make safe decisions? Um, and if we only have information from Joe, should we act on it just in case? 
uh, then what do we think is at risk? It can be a very different story um, for folks in ranching communities who maybe structures aren't at risk, but crops are their main income. If fire comes through, they want to protect those crops because that's the only way they're going to be able to afford to build their house. There are these very varied values and um, some of the values in these places are more about the place and the relationship to them. These are special places to people. And if you have generations of family history in these areas, connections that go back, um, the places that are burning are precious to you. Um, there's also that challenge of kind of infrastructural values. In uh, the East Troublesome Fire, people thought they might be able to go through Trail Ridge out through the National Park. That ended up not being the case. It got, um, stuff started burning over there really quickly. There wasn't really time to communicate it. Um, so there's kind of that back and forth of how you negotiate all these values. You have all these different things you're thinking about in this network of getting information in the system of fire behavior. It's a really challenging time to make decisions and feel confident about them. So when we brought these models to folks and talked with them about it, we actually learned a lot to bring back to our modelers. And we worked with Scott when we did the East Troublesome Fire first. We got a lot of feedback from folks there on how to improve it so that they can navigate it. And we went back a few different times on um, different versions, different viewpoints, what we thought would be most useful when we came to do the Marshall Fire study. Um, so a few things I'll highlight that we took away from this that um, hopefully modelers can adopt moving forward. The first is making it local. It's really cool to see high level stuff. People want to see the full fire, but they also want to know where their house is on that. Or for the Marshall Fire, people really want to know where Costco was because that was so central to a lot of people's experience. They got stuck in traffic there. They came out and saw it for the first time there. It told a big piece of the community's story. So understanding where that was on the map helped people orient themselves to it really quickly. Similar story in Grand Lake. People wanted the lakes uh, labeled. They wanted the key county roads labeled, just so they could see where they were at in the maps, and they could zoom in and, and get a sense of how their story fit in with the bigger fire. We also found less is more. In some earlier versions of our visualizations, we had a lot of arrows or um, wind barbs, a lot of detail, because that was really exciting to us as scientists, I think. That's a lot for someone who's just been slapped down an iPad to look at for the first time. So we kind of um, drew back a little bit. We lessened the amount of information. We made separate visualizations, one that focused on smoke, one that focused on the fire, one that focused on the wind, so that we could really pass out that story in ways that um, didn't overwhelm people with really cool visualizations. Then we had this back and forth about how realistic should we make the fires look? Because that can be really traumatizing in itself to live that experience, even if it's just on a TV screen. Um, folks in the East Troublesome really wanted it to be realistic. They, they had processed. We went a couple years after that fire. They wanted to see their story accurately represented, whereas I think with the Marshall Fire, we were coming in of just over a year after this fire. Um, and folks were um, a little hesitant about seeing it too close. They preferred maps and things like that. So I think the timing of when we bring visualizations to people is important too. Then the last one I want to touch on, viewpoints that matter to people. Where was everyone standing when they saw that fire? A lot of people were kind of around the south end of uh, Grand Lake looking over. Folks from Costco want to see viewpoints from Costco. Or you had a visualization that looked from Louisville from superior, from the top of town towards the uh, flat iron so that people could orient themselves. We want to give people as many opportunities to connect their story to this visualization so that we can both learn as possible. I think we might visit our last two Slido slides, if that's OK. And the first one we had was, uh, how do you plan to access information during a fire? So fantastic. We've got a whole range of things here. Emergency alert system notifications. We're seeing maybe a little bit of a story about how reliable they can be. Uh, so I like seeing that there's a variety. You want to probably look in different sources. Although emergency alert systems are where you're going to find the most truthful information. Um, you might remember a few years ago in Tennessee, there was a fire near Gatlinburg, near Dollywood, and all of that stuff. Um, in that uh, area, 
the fire took down telephone communications really early on. So less than 17% of people in that community got texts. And we can see really similar stories. We can plan for these with good intentions. The fire holds a narrative when these events are happening. So it's great to see that we have a diversity of different places that we're going. Um, the second piece is thinking about, is it trustworthy? If it's from a, a neighbor, or social media, is it someone posting who has a background or works for the fire department? Where do they get that information from? Don't be shy to ask those questions to figure out the story behind the, the information you're getting. Next slide, I think the last one is, do you know where you'd go during an evacuation? Wow. wow. <laughs> Interesting. So we're very split. And maybe a show of hands, if you said yes, was it somewhere you'd been before? Is it a family member? Is it uh, a location you know? For the people who said no, is that because you haven't evacuated before? I'm seeing a lot of nods. Yeah, when you go through an experience like this, you have an idea now of what's happening. If you haven't, it's kind of a lot of effort to think about all these hypotheticals and what that would be. Um, for you, where's the fire coming from? What does that look like? So if we head back to the slide. Here you go back to the PowerPoint. Oh, thank you. A few things that we've learned across all of these studies about how to prepare for evacuation. And I think just preaching to the choir for some folks in the room, good for, food for thought for others. Um, and hopefully there's something new you can take away from this. The big one, which it's exciting to see, this is where most people are going to go for information, sign up for those local emergency alerts. So many counties have to rely on those opt-in ones, uh, the technology where you can kind of draw on the map. You want everyone with cell service in that area to get it. That can be um, temperamental. Not everyone can afford to use it. It's only accessible within certain levels of the government sometime. So you might not always see that. So sign up for those but it's good to rely on other sources or your own um, decision making as well. A really common piece of advice is to pack a go bag. If you Google online, you'll see there's seven P's of evacuation and that's stuff like people, pets, prescriptions, paperwork, um, most common things you wanna grab. If you have a lot of that in a bag that you keep near your door, that's one less thing to worry about and you can plan on packing your spaghetti and other stuff. Um, <laughs> you can focus on that stuff instead. Um, so that is a lot of effort, and um, I always shudder when I think about my go bag because it has clothes I never wear in it, so I'd be horrified if I was stuck in all these really old clothes. But um, one thing that I've heard a lot of people do is they take their laundry basket because that is the clothes you wear all the time. You can go to the laundromat and have something to do while you're waiting for information, um, especially if you have a big family and that fills up quickly. That's probably going to be your best um, Call of action if everyone in your household bothers to put it in there instead of on the floor. Um, then related to that, one of those P's is paperwork. Think about what documents you'd really need to kickstart um, your recovery or your return after a fire. Um, you might think about grabbing passports and things, uh, birth certificates. A lot of times at recovery centers, if it is a serious fire, you'll be able to access a lot of those. So as long as you have one form of ID, I'd say um, that's a great starting point. Then think about what you're going to need to maybe start insurance claims. And a lot of times that's evidence that you own your house or that you have an insurance policy. So there are a few documents that you can really prioritize email to yourself so that you can kind of get to the front of the line in that, um, in that kind of condensed timeline of how you set things back up again if you've lost things. Then uh, we're kind of splitting this room on where we'd go. Have an idea of where you want to go and then all the different ways you can get there. If you're planning to head to Fort Collins and you're going up the uh, main highway, what happens if that's closed? Do you have a route around it? Or um, if the end of your neighborhood is closed, do you have another way around? Um, we spoke with people who drove their vehicles over Davidson Mesa to get out during the Marshall Fire. There's a lot of um, urgency to that. So think about if you go this way, is that going to be you locked in traffic? Are there going to be other ways? Kind of thinking through those scenarios in your head. I know it's not fun, but it can be really helpful. Um, and with that, I'd say, think about your own trigger points. So we heard that in the East Troublesome Fire, um, there was Highway 125. A lot of people felt 
oh, sorry, that if the fire crossed that, personally, they didn't feel comfortable staying at home anymore. So what is it for you and your household when you think about where you live, that when it gets too close, that's when you start to get uneasy because you should listen to that instinct and act on it. Don't wait for someone to tell you. Um, and a lot of people, it did seem like the Davidson-Mason area um, and the highway were big trigger points for the Marshall Fire. The last one is uh, talk about this with members of your family. I really encourage, if you're having dinner with your family or everyone in your household, just talk about it for five minutes one day. And then it's done. You've had that conversation. I've done this kind of research across a lot of different communities. You'd be surprised by how many couples have completely different ideas of what they do. Uh, the husband often wants to stay. It's very gendered. Men often want to stay. Women often want to leave and fire. Don't wait until you get that text to make the discovery that the other members of your household are thinking about doing something different. That's a great thing to talk about um, uh, ahead of time and what kind of your own personal comfort level is and when you'd leave. Across all of this and in both of our fires, we really heard people say at the end of the day, it was their intuition to leave. They started to get uncomfortable. That was their decision to leave early or to leave as the fire was coming. Um, so don't listen, uh, don't ignore that. If you feel uncomfortable, that's a great sign that it might be time to leave and you don't need other people to tell you. Better to be safe than sorry always, I think. So we just shared a very tiny glimpse of this project. There are so many different pieces of it. We have components that are very into the evacuation pieces and recommendations. We have pieces about recovery after Marshall Fire. We'd love to talk more with you about those things or if you have an experience with a Marshall Fire that you want to share. We're in town for a couple of weeks. We'd love to meet with you for coffee and make sure that your story is heard in this. One of the strengths we have as scientists is being able to tell your stories on broader platforms so they can create change in other places. Um, please reach out if you're interested in chatting. Um, I think maybe we can go to questions if there's nothing else to add. Great. Can we get, oh. Yep, okay. Uh, if anyone has a question, please raise your hand so the folks online can hear as well. You talked about building trust with the community after this. Was that left to the police or the fire people or like our county commissioners? That's a good question. Who's responsible for building trust? I think it's the same as who's responsible for risk with fire in the beginning. It's a little bit of everyone. Um, but it's going to vary across places. So um, some places I've been, the county has a history of uh, conflict with the community. It, they need to work on that. In other places, it's the Forest Service. So it depends on the fire and who people feel uh, have lost trust in that area. So that in a lot of places, that ends up being who they'd expect to receive an emergency notification from. And when it doesn't come, um, what's going on there. A few things I think that professionals can do to regain that trust is talk really frankly about why that didn't happen. I think it's really easy to sweep under the rug. Oh, uh, we can't talk about that or uh, whatever. But if you have that open conversation about the system we paid for didn't work or um, we thought we were going to have more time or maybe we just need more planning and we weren't in a place where we planned for this fire. Um, I think that transparency can go a long way, but it definitely decreases trust a little before um, we can go into that. So when you hear authorities say they make mistakes, hopefully that's the beginning of a conversation where you can press them to, um, to change their activities. Does that answer your question? That's a good question, and I would I know that there's a group of residents who are coming together to talk about evacuation, um, and I think that kind of community pressure is really valuable um, because change doesn't happen without people ask, advocating and keeping it fresh. Um, it sounds like it varies from my read on different authorities. Like, there's different levels of trust in Louisville versus Superior governments, so I think. I, c I don't know the full backstories, but a lot of times these histories um, have been around uh, a history of conflict for a long time, and it takes a fire to um, really bring that conflict to the surface. So I'd say for some of the locations affected by the Marshall Fire, 
their fire was the most recent catalyst. They need to talk about the full story and have that out in the open. We went to, um, there was a round table at the Louisville Rec Recreation Center or um, community. Uh, community center where they had different um, governors there to answer questions. I think that's a good start, but it can't just be a drop in for an hour on TV. And that's not a criticism, appreciate that they did that. Um, but it still leaves a lot on the locals to fix. And then there's that challenge of what's feasible in policy uh, versus um, in re uh, what do we think is feasible versus what's realistic policy. And some of these things that we know need to change take a long time. Uh, having these conversations, igniting these um, discussions about what needs to change can repair some of that trust. And then you're unified moving forward to try and affect change at those larger levels, I think. so really varies on their place, but I think the pieces are starting to come together from what I see in this area to really have those open conversations. And I think it will get easier over time too. Thank you. My question is regarding fire mitigation. Um, I live right down the road here, so I was evacuated yep. during the NCAR fire last year. Mm -hmm. I'm also on the board of directors for our homeowners association, and we are dealing with fire mitigation right now. Two questions that came up in my mind right away were, um, you had mentioned something about wooden fences around the Marshall Fire. We're dealing with that right now. Our community is, I think it was built in the 19, early 1970s. And we have wood that is falling down, wooden fences. It's very expensive to replace it. And my, my, my first question is, what do you think about that? My second question is one that came up in our meeting last month, and it regards uh, charcoal grills. Mm. If, if that is dangerous, or we've been asked. And right now, we can't find anything that says that you shouldn't allow charcoal grills. But we did a walkthrough with two fire mitigation people right after we were evacuated. Mm -hmm. And they recommended that you tell the community not to have charcoal grills. I wrote that down in my notes. Last month, the question came up because we have a resident who said that he can't find anything online that talks about it. Huh. And so I can't find anything either. Yeah. So my second question is, what do you think about charcoal grills for fire <laughs> mitigation? Two great questions. The first question was about the fence replacement, the cost and the challenges around that. Um, I think there's a real tension with a lot, especially in HOAs, about how far you want to push your residents versus involve them and like have them come to the table. Um, and a lot of times that depends on what funding is available. So I'd say if you can look into like Firewise does have grants. If you're going the Firewise uh, community route, there can be funding there for things like that. You could go the code route and require it. I know that would not make you popular as a no. HOA person. <laughs> um, but there's um, kind of this window of opportunity after fires where people are willing to negotiate. And I think you're, you're towards the end of that now. Often it's only six months after a fire. It really is short. And then we're moving on thinking about the next fire season. Um, so I think thinking about using those windows of opportunity to engage those questions, you're absolutely doing the right thing by bringing people in and having that conversation. That's fantastic to hear. Um, so I think looking for sources to cost share that if that's private fence, um, having those conversations or talking about would it affect insurance? Um, is that going to make uh, a lot of times financial conversations? They won't at all. Then it may just come down to a level of comfort and um, could you prioritize households that uh, maybe are the wicks with fences and start with them because they're, if they're the starting points, to get those folks on board. Community, uh, four years on this ah. And the fire that we had with NCAR was a quarter mile from mm -hmm. my house. And I'm an advocate for, I know it's going to cost a lot, but I think we should yep. replace our wooden fences with the charcoal grill. Yep. Um, but trying to get that, you know, the whole community getting together. Yeah. And others are saying you should ban it. If it was my own private home, I could do whatever I want. Yeah. But, you know, homeowners. Oh. Yeah, I, uh, it's a difficult kind of either or, and I wonder if you could say, okay, 
it's either you replace the fence or it's a conversation about removing everything away from the fence and clearing that space and which one would you rather do? Um, I wonder if there's that. And then the question about charcoal grills, um, that's interesting. I didn't know there wasn't any documentation about that. And I wonder if you could push for, uh, okay, if there's no documentation around that, then the area you have a charcoal grill on needs to be fire-wise. It needs to be brick. You can't be having it on grass and you kind of set those parameters instead. Um, that's a workaround. Um, that is interesting. And I wonder if it, because it's an enclosed flame, technically, that's how um, it hasn't been the focus of more study. Yeah, they had studies that showed that uh, propane gas grills are just as equal. Propane is just as equal um, as charcoal grills. Mm. And they're not forbidding propane tanks. Yep. So if you can't, if you can do propane, why can't you do charcoal grills. Yes. But to me it just it's not a smart decision, but you know, yeah. I don't I don't make those decisions. Forgive the lighting it is on a timer and they will get it turned back <laughs> on in just a second. Are not moving enough here. Um Oh, I am I'm going so to go sorry. ahead I'm and ask um, <laughs> a question from our online audience. Um just to make sure that we are getting their thoughts in the room as well. Um, I'm going to bring up if you could bring Slido, please, and we can look at Catherine's question. Yeah. So how often are the models that are used by response groups like fire, EMS, and city planners um, mm -hmm. during well, how? I think she meant how often are they refreshed? I want to say that. Um, if Catherine is still there, um, there's a verb missing. I think they're just asking, um, are they being right. used? Yeah. Yeah, how often are they being used? That's better. Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, you know, obviously in research world, uh, we like to think that they're being used frequently, but of course that doesn't happen without close collaboration with these folks. Um, there were recent efforts uh, by the state of uh, Colorado to uh, utilize um, some of our uh, fuel models, uh, fire models for operational purposes. Um, and we're hoping that in the future there, of course, will be more funding to extend those those types of um, efforts. Uh, I think there's a lot going on in the research side of things to try to um, improve the the speed up of these models, right? Because uh, oftentimes they can be fairly expensive um, if you want to run them for a larger area. So um, I would say in general, at the moment, uh, they're certainly not being as used as much as they should be. Uh, oftentimes what happens is um, a fire starts and there will be an incident meteorologist uh, who is assigned to that fire. They're, they will have a group of people with them and kind of on the scene, they'll just see what the conditions are like, what the winds are like, um, and use really fast, simple models, um, which don't take into account these more complex interactions. Oftentimes, they do a decent job of giving, uh, you know, a uh, broader picture of what's happening, but at fine local scales, uh, it's really missing key things. And so, yeah, incorporating the models that we're using that are uh, that are coupled together are, are critical. And um, I, yeah, I think moving forward, yeah, we need to uh, certainly use them more. I will say that we had uh, run these simulations previously in the cloud. So now, uh, you know, you have Amazon Cloud. Um, we can actually uh, get them to run in the cloud at this point, which will help um, with cost and, and speed. So, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, so, yeah, if you have thoughts, uh, certainly more than happy to engage there. Let's move into an in-the-room question. Um, so on the Marshall Fire, there was um, a hotel that was on, I guess, the uh, west side of US 36. And um, I, I remember talking with people and thinking, that went up in flames, and it supplied a lot of ash and debris that got blown over onto the rest of Louisville. And what model, would that be your model or maybe these smaller models that you were talking about that could model an impact of that kind of structure located on the western side of a town that gets 100 mile an hour winds going in that direction? Like, um, could that be used to help with city planning or kind of 
making sure that doesn't happen again. Yeah, so you're you're thinking more so, you know, after the fact, you know, looking at hypothetical si situations to see how, you know, certain wind patterns and certain structures, how they're burning would affect, you know, parts of the town downwind, right? So, yeah, that's certainly possible. Um, the model that we use doesn't get down to kind of like structure level combustion uh, uh, chemistry and, and physics. Uh, there are models that do that. They're extremely expensive and they're typically used to look at, you know, individual buildings or clusters of buildings. So trying to bridge that gap, you know, between those types of models and the models that we're using, I think is an important piece moving forward. Uh, another thing is our model currently uh, only accounts for wildland fire fuels. So, you know, grasses, shrubs, trees, uh, the like. And it doesn't include actually um, urban areas and, and buildings. And so that's one area of active research uh, that we're currently pursuing because, uh, you know, as you know, that's critical. And, and once that's into, into place, you know, the atmospheric model is already kind of ready to um, to take that information in. So if a structure were to burn, then we can see, you know, how potentially debris or smoke would be transported. So yeah, it's not quite there yet, but there's, uh, there's definitely efforts going on right now. Yeah. And Thanks. I think um, if you look, and I'm not going to remember that acronym, but it's something like IBHS. Um, there's a institute that does research for insurance companies about how structures burn and things like that. They're based in Maryland. And folks from that organization came out to the Marshall Fire afterwards and wrote a report about their thoughts. That's why we know some of the fences were a huge risk or a concern, a driver perhaps. Um, but I think if you look at their kind of approach, that's where we're going. And it's, um, it's a really big shame that we don't have an uh, accurate read on how multiple buildings burn and interact with each other yet. I think that's a really important area of growth um, that we want to see more modeling in because we only see half of the story um, when we can't model those uh, urban areas. So you're highlighting a really key need right there as well. Going to move on to a slider question. It's going to be a question. There's an add on to it. Um, so if we could please bring on Kaylee. Um, they asked, how often did you interview does with homes affected that were second homes um, versus primary homes? How did their attitudes or answers differ and we have a follow-up also from Karen, who said regarding that I highlighted it regarding Kaylee's point. Second homeowner thoughts may vary in circumstance. Was the renter a friend or family? Did the owner plan to make it a main home in the future? So those are a conglomerate of questions for y'all. Those are great questions. So I would say um, in the East Troublesome Fire. Maybe a third of the people we spoke with were second homeowners. Um, and we really focus on getting their perspective for the very reason that they are often different. They have somewhere else they can go when they evacuate. They have um, a, a home that they can live in if that one is lost. Um, those opinions do vary. But uh, in a lot of studies we've done also in Arizona, um, a lot of people feel like their second home is the place they really want to be living in their main areas, like some, uh, I'll say for Arizona, it's Phoenix, and no one talks positively about Phoenix. <laughs> I don't know if that's the case for Den Denver, but um, they, they're much more excited about their second home, and they care about that location. And a lot of times, they are thinking about a long-term vision where they're putting money into that property because it's their retirement home, and they see a future there. So I would say... While their thoughts and their uh, views of risk um, are often different, they're not realizing that there is fire risk there, um, or they're not yet willing to invest money in those mitigations, they are concerned and aware of what they're losing. And when it came to evacuation, um, not as many were there. And we actually met with a few people who have ring doorbell cameras, and they were so concerned about their house, they'd log into that and watch the impacts of their property on their phone from hundreds of miles away or were able to figure out if it was standing or not when electricity came back on. So we see those crowds relying a lot more on um, that kind of technology to figure out if, if the house is OK when they're away. For the Marshall Fire, I don't think we met with as many second homes. Just a few. Just a couple. Um, and there were in both of these places, I think, a lot of people who have second homes, but they're Airbnbs, so it's a source of income. Um, 
that maybe they're saving for something or they can't afford to have both houses without doing that. So um, one thing we did hear a lot about in the Marshall fire was um, if you had multiple properties affected in the fire, it was really hard to claim insurance on multiple properties. So one person had, um, at a public meeting we went to said he had six uh, rental units. Um, he wasn't getting it. He was actually going into the red and he wasn't going to make any of that back. So investments um, are really difficult to hold on to. So it's not all sunshine and rainbows when you have multiple um, homes. There's a much greater risk that you're going to lose something just statistically. Um, but I'd say for uh, these studies, um, it was they they cared the same about the place, even if their story and their risk around that place wasn't the same. Some questions in the middle of the room. Um, yeah, no, I was signaling you. Oli is going to come with the mic. Put my hokas on for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, thank you for the presentation. This has been really great. Uh, I think fire is near and dear to the heart of many people in this area at this point. Um, I had a rather specific question, and that is, I have heard that ember casting is a major threat to structures well ahead of the fire front. Is that model data field available? And if so, have you tried to visualize it? So we do now have ember spotting in the model. Uh, <clears throat> recently, uh, Maria Frediani, who's a, a colleague with us, uh, implemented that into our, the model. Um, I don't know, did we, I think we added the outputs to the, to the vapor visualization or, okay. Yeah, yeah, the particle data. Yeah, so I guess we haven't yet visualized it. Um, coming soon. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there's certainly you know uh, a lot of interest in that area because, as you say, that's that's the reason these these fires tend to spread rapidly. Um, it happened, of course, in the East Troublesome Fire and then in the Marshall Fire. That's how it jumped the highway and and was able to get into to Louisville. Um, so that's another area where there's a lot of research going on right now because uh, there's so much randomness and uncertainty associated with you know how these embers are uh, initially produced and how they're transported and where they land and what fuels they land on and all of this. So um, yeah, that's that's something that you know we're actively looking at and uh, yeah, it's a very important consideration. And so. correct me if I'm wrong, but um, some of the ember behavior we see, models really can't uh, wrap their computer minds around. So when we did the East Troublesome one, I believe when it jumped the cont continental divide, you guys had to go and manually and start it on the other side because it, it, the way the model thinks, it, there's no way that it could jump that. So that right, in the in the Marshall Fire, that oh, was. Oh, and in the Marshall yeah, Fire as well. Yeah, right. So yeah, in the East Troublesome Fire, right, it jumped the Continental Divide um, to the east side. And the model, so at the moment, what we have in the model, it's it's not starting new fires because, you know, we hope that we get the ember spotting right. If we don't, and it starts new fires, and it can just kind of get out of hand quickly. So, so that's a whole separate thing. Um, but in the East Troublesome Fire, it was able to uh, actually spot over the divide a little bit. In the Marshall Fire, it didn't. Part of that is just because of the fuels, right? Uh, the urban uh, component of the fuels is an important piece that that is kind of missing at this point. So, yeah, that was that was a kind of complicated uh, simulation uh, that the model really isn't intended to do. But we're we're kind of expanding it now to to account for these types of things. Yeah, thank you. We have a slider question also asking about models, so you might as well keep the mic. Good, <laughs> please bring it up. Um, where can we find the model for the Marshall Fire, and does the model include both initiation points? Oh. Yep. So uh, actually, we did just recently publish uh, our our modeling results on the Marshall Fire. Um, and I'm yeah happy to share that uh, after the fact and and in the paper we have the data sets um, that that were used to generate the outputs and so um, as uh, Scott said we have a lot of outputs on the order of terabytes so um, you know we're happy to share those with you we just can't upload all of those to a repository it's just not possible um, but yes we have the information about kind of the model inputs and and where the fire was uh, ignited and at what time and all of that so yeah if you'd like to reach out I'm more than happy to uh, to discuss that further thanks we'll take one more question from the room <laughs> 
I guess I do. Hi, um, my name's Emma. I actually work over at the UCAR Center for Science Education, so I'm just in a neighboring program. Um, thank you for the presentation. I, Tim, one of the examples that you brought up in your slides, um, one of the models, you had talked about how it didn't account for suppression efforts in that one. Is that anything that's possible with modeling or visualization, or is that something that you're looking into? I imagine it's probably complicated because people who are on the ground are... I don't know, adapting every second to the situations, but I'm curious. Yeah, suppression is one thing that we haven't started to tackle at this point. Um, I think, as you say, it's it's complicated for a number of reasons. Um, I think the biggest challenge is that the folks who are on the ground are, of course, most concerned with you know saving life and property, which is what they should be concerned with. So in order to get you know that into the model, we need kind of real-time feedback on where the fire is being suppressed, how it's being suppressed. So until I think there's more um, efforts uh, like on the ground to you know, have a job that's specifically doing those types of things, it's, it can be, I think, pretty hard to get in the model. But I think, yeah, going back and like historically looking at simulations to see how suppression um, uh, would affect the, the model simulation uh, is something that we can do. Uh, we haven't really gone that route too much. Some people are looking at that at this point. Um, but yeah, that's that's another important aspect. So you guys are pointing out all of the, the parts of the model that we're working on, so <laughs> thanks. Um, I'm gonna take the last question. Um, it's my question. Um, <laughs> fine, it's fine. Uh, it's not about fires. Um, but is that if there are any students watching this today and they want to be as great as all of you are, what advice do you have for them? The hard hitting question here. You just got uh, over there. I, I know, I know. <laughs> um, I'll start then. Um, I think don't be shy to send an email. Like, my start in research was just sending an email to someone I didn't know. Don't be afraid to reach out. And then don't be afraid to look stupid. The one time you get away with that for free is when you're a student. And you can use that to your advantage to learn things that maybe just asking the simplest questions can reveal new information. So I think when you're a student, you're in a really unique place to leverage um, assumptions that people have about you to get new information that people further along in their career cannot. Um, so don't be shy to, to try something. Yeah, I think piggybacking off of that, um, try a lot of different things when you're starting out. Again, when you're a student, that's your best chance to like make mistakes and try things out. Obviously, down the road, you want to specialize in a few things and be really good at it, but um, I think I've found that I have a lot of interests, and when I pursue those, it can open a lot of interesting doors, and I think that's how I ended up in this position, working with convergence research. I guess I'll add to this. Um, I would say one thing that's really nice about uh, today's world is there's a lot of you know, virtual seminars, virtual talks, virtual things. Um, so granted, it's not the same as, you know, being in person and interacting with people. Uh, certainly take advantage of those things. You know, oftentimes in listservs, they'll, they'll put out these, these events. And even if it's not in your, uh, I think, area of expertise or like what you're uh, most uh, interested in, it's good to branch out and learn uh, some other topics and, and understand kind of what else is going on. Um, it's, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, crossover now between disciplines, and so uh, not being too narrow, I think, uh, is important, and really trying to trying to broaden uh, your, your skill set as well. I guess I would say, um, depending on what level you're at in your education, uh, if you're before college, I would say really pay attention to what you're learning in math uh, mathematics. I think we all have some Mathematical background, no. <laughs> Statistically, no. <laughs> well, maybe Tim and I do, um, <laughs> but I, I, I'm sure I'm sure you guys have a uh, background in that. But I don't know. I would say cling on to the mathematics and and, and science um, because it's applicable. I think in in most, if not all, fields. Well, thank you. Um, and with that, uh, I'm just going to thank you all again. Um, and let's thank our speakers first for that. Yeah. They managed to make this an amazing talk, and I'm so happy I got to be here for this. Um, thank you all again for attending this great panel on evacuations as part of our Explorer series. 
Um, we have a great talk coming in August 30th about total solar eclipses. So if you want to learn about how total darkness is the answer to seeing the sun, this is it. It's going to be here on August 30th. Um, if you're interested in more NCAR Explorer Series events, definitely check out our website for lectures and conversations. And if you want to see this again, that recording is going to live there. Um, now for the survey part. If you are 18 years or older, please take a moment to fill out our three to five anonymous survey that is going to help us understand the impact of the program and how we can improve for our next event. The survey will close on Monday, August 7th. Um, you can find the survey by scanning that QR code. You can also ask a staff member, either Aliyah or Alexandra, um, if you would like some help um, to take the survey using one of our tablet computers. I really hope to see all of y'all next time. I have memorized all your faces. Um, and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you so much for being here.